Hey guys, I just wanted to give you a quick update on my visit to the neurologist yesterday. He could not give me any definitive answers as all my tests came back relatively normal. I am scheduled to see an ENT doctor and an ophthalmologist. I am also scheduled to have another MRI of the brain. Please continue to pray for God's continued healing touch as my eyesight and the numbness on the right side of my face have improved. Thank you all so much for your prayers during this difficult time. God bless you guys. The Watchman. Be sure to follow this ministry on BitChute and Rumble, where you can see extended news coverage with biblical commentary. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a child of God? 1 John 3.10 explains what it means to be a child of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. The life of a child of God will be completely different from the life of the unsaved. A child of God has a desire to live in a way that pleases the Heavenly Father, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Many people wrongly believe that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us this is not true. We can only become his children when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes what happens when we are born again into the family of God through faith in Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus taught that becoming children of God means we must experience a new birth, as we read in John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A child of God is no longer a child of the devil, and God sets about transforming his children through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Romans 8, 13, and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. If we do not begin to look like our Heavenly Father in word, desire, and action, we are most likely not really his, as we read in 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Human beings were created to live as children of God. Sin marred that purpose and broke that bond with him. Christ restores us to that original relationship. For all eternity, the sons and daughters of God will worship him, as one united family, as we read in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. A child of God lives for him on earth, and eagerly awaits a future with him in heaven, as we read in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, 
apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Hope you had a good Easter. You know, even in a decaying Christendom, there is something so heartening about Sunday service on Easter morn with the church pews packed as they rarely are. And, oh, wait, no, sorry, that my mistake. That was the old Easter. Before the state rolled the stone in front of the church door, so the Hosannas were decidedly muted yesterday. Singing remains forbidden in California churches. In Spain, they've taken the additional precaution of banning hymnals. In Greece, they've banned loudspeakers, just in case you're tempted to hold an outdoor service. But really, why not just cut to the chase? In Ireland, all in-person services are illegal. And Pastor Cronin, at the Abundant Grace Church in Dublin was arrested mid-service. What's the proper response to that? Here's Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky in Calgary, Alberta. Please get out. Get out of this property. Immediately get out. Okay. Get out of this property. Okay. Immediately. Out. I don't want to hear anything. Out of this property. I immediately. Don't I don't want to hear a word. I out. Out. Out of this property immediately until you come back with a warrant. He called them Nazis and the Gestapo. Preach it, preacher man. And through the sheer power of his words, he drove the coppers down the stairs like Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple. For it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, and ye are not going to make it a den of totalitarian goons. The only people committing a crime there were Her Majesty's miserable and unworthy Calgary Constabulary, who were in breach of Section 176 of the Canadian Criminal Code. Quote, everyone who willfully disturbs or interrupts an assemblage of persons met for religious worship is guilty of an offence punishable on summary conviction. That's a slam dunk, and that Canadian pastor should file a complaint with, uh, oh, the police. There is a tragic element to the diminished state of the Christian churches a year into this thing. If ever there were a huge opportunity for religious ministry, a world in which everything else is dead, movies, shows, sports, concerts, restaurants, all the noisy distractions of the secular consumerist life is surely it. Yet for the most part, Starting with the social justice pontiff in the Vatican blaming COVID on climate change, the churches blew it. And saddest of all, an unchurched year has seen church membership in the U.S. fall for the first time below 50% of Americans. Which is a pity, because when the churches fall silent, the only religion left is the state. Amos 8:11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God that it will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Even worse than a famine of physical food is a famine of spiritual food. How tragic to turn a deaf ear to God and be given a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. There is nothing more essential than God. There is nothing more essential to the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, one through four, Paul declares what the gospel is and how important it is to embrace it and share it with others. He reminds the Corinthians of the gospel he preached among them, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the essence of the gospel, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross for sinners, and his resurrection to everlasting life is central to our Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yesterday we showed you this remarkable scene. 
a policeman yes. in a supposedly civilized country busting into an Easter service and attempting to close it down, uh, which was in fact an illegal act by those coppers. In this case, the mass ranks of the constabulary didn't measure up to one determined pastor and he cast them out of his church. That preacher joins us now, Arthur Palowski. Uh, pastor, it is great to see you. You're joining us from Calgary, where those nice Canadian police uh, suddenly invaded. And you, you basically, through the sheer force of your personality, threw them out of the uh, temple. And it was a wonderful thing to see those guys uh, retreating down the stairs. What's interesting is uh, you grew up behind the Iron Curtain. And what happened to you uh, over Easter is exactly, I take it, why you didn't want to stay behind the Iron Curtain. That's exactly, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I grew up under communist dictatorship behind the Iron Curtain under the boot of the Soviets. And I'm telling you, that's no fun at all. Um, mm. It was a disaster. Uh, police officers could break into your house five in the morning. They could beat you up, torture. They could arrest you for no matter what reason they would come up with. That was a famous saying in Poland when I was growing up by the police. Give me a man and we will find something on that man. So it was like a black, uh, you know, flashback when those police officers showed up at my church. Everything kind of came back to life from my childhood. And the only thing I could do is to fend off the wolves as a shepherd. And I used my voice to get rid of them. They were illegally uh, encroaching on our rights during the most holy days, during the Passover celebration. Uh, how dare they? Uh, the audacity of those people coming, it was a shocking thing. I was a little bit shaken, uh, but I did what every shepherd right now on the planet Earth should be doing fend off the wolves. We as lions should never bow before the hyenas, and that's what they are right now. Well, the hyenas are uh, fairly confident in their powers, and a lot of the things that have become accepted in the last year, uh, for example, New York police uh, kicking a woman to the ground because she's not wearing a mask, uh, governors of American states and Canadian provinces telling you whether you're allowed to have your granny uh, or your aunt over for Christmas or Thanksgiving. I mean, that is the kind of tight 24-7 uh, control that most communist countries lived under for half a century from the end of the Second World War. Is it all beginning to look worryingly familiar to you, the way people accept it? Yes, it is. I have been warning Canadians for the past 16 years that uh, that's what's coming. I could smell it. I could see it at every corner. The implementation of what we are seeing now, it, was, it started way, way uh, about 20 years ago. So uh, growing up under communist dictatorship, I mean, that's a disaster. That's hell on earth. And I see it already in our Western democracies. So the only way um, I know how to fight them is 1981 that I witnessed millions of Poles taking to the streets and saying to them, no more, get out of our country, get out, stop. Millions of Poles took it to the streets during mm -hmm. solidarity, like Valenza, and they won their freedom. Right now, if you want your freedom back, because we have to remember, history is teaching us that those people will never give up their new uh, gain powers. You got to right. demand those rights back. You have to fight for your rights. They'll never give it back to you freely. So how to do it? Get them out of your properties, out of your businesses, out of your churches. Open up. Open the churches. Clergymen should unite and start pushing this darkness away. And we should come and take to the streets and say no more lockdowns, no more restrictions. We will not put up with this anymore. We are fighting back. If you don't think this will ever happen in America, think again. It is becoming evident that God is allowing Satan, the God of this world, to begin a seven year reign of unspeakable horror. The question is, are you ready? Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ, believe in the authority of the Bible. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted in the United States like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. 
the world will persecute true Christians, and Scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things, fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. Brothers and sisters, put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10-18 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Another disturbing random attack. This time it was in New York City, and the victim knows a thing or two about crime. She used to cover it as a television reporter. She spoke with Amber Cogliano. It doesn't look so great, does it? This woman's face is black and blue after she was sucker punched on Easter Sunday. I see this guy coming towards me. 75-year-old Judith Thomas was walking to Easter dinner when she was attacked out of nowhere, as seen in this surveillance footage. All of a sudden, he delivers this hellacious punch right in my mouth. The suspect is seen crouching under the scaffolding and slamming his fist into Judith's face. Then you see her collapse to the ground. I was where you are standing. And when he punched me, I went down like a sack of potatoes. And then I began, I just put my face in my hands and I was saying, oh my God, oh my God, what just happened? What we have is chaos. This is happening to other people. It's happening to Asians. It's happening to lots of people. And it's crazy. It's the latest in a disturbing spate of unprovoked attacks on the streets of New York. On Saturday, a 73-year-old man was minding his own business when a deranged thug pummeled him in the face. Of course, there was the brutal assault that stirred outrage across the USA when an elderly Asian American woman was kicked in the chest and stomped on the head. Three men inside a luxury apartment building did not come to her aid, closing the door shut. The doormen have now been fired. And last October, 67-year-old actor Rick Moranis was sucker punched by a stranger on the sidewalk. 
The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Update on a road rage shooting that killed a Lancaster County mother of six. Police say 29-year-old John R. Floyd was arrested this morning in Lumberton, North Carolina. He's charged with first-degree murder of 47-year-old Julie Eberle. She and her husband Ryan were driving to South Carolina back on March 25th when their car came close to hitting another vehicle on I-95 in North Carolina. That driver then pulled up next to them and opened fire, killing Eberle. The sheriff's office says that he's been in and out of prison for very serious crimes, felonies. In fact, he wasn't supposed to have a weapon. The name is Dewan Floyd. He was arrested at Parkview a Apartments and officers say again he shot and killed Julie Everly last week after a road rage incident on 95 South. She and her husband were headed to the beach from Pennsylvania. They were celebrating their wedding anniversary. Floyd is charged with first degree murder and discharging a weapon into an occupied property. He did appear in court for the first time today. The judge denied bond for him. And I just spoke with the sheriff. He slept about two hours over the past couple of days working on leads for this case and eventually catching the suspect and he tells me about the moment when he finally did bring in the suspect to custody. Take a listen. Uh, it's sad for the family still, but I'm pleased to bring it to a, a conclusion, particularly today because uh, Miss Julie Eberly, the uh, victim here, her funeral is today. So our detectives were able to notify the family about six o'clock this morning that the arrest had been made and they were beyond pleased, even though, you know, they're going through this today. It happened during the morning rush hour. I have a male subject in an army type suit with an AR-15. Shots fired at an office park in Frederick, Maryland. Two Navy sailors wounded, one of them critically, in an attack at an unmarked military office. One shot wound to the chest. The suspected shooter identified by authorities as 38-year-old Fantahoon Wodasenbet, also an active duty sailor, who sped off before police arrived. Suspect vehicle, black Nissan with Virginia tags. Within minutes, the suspect was at the gate to Fort Detrick, about five miles away, where he breached the checkpoint, making it about half a mile onto base with police in hot pursuit. Eventually, law enforcement shooting and killing Walter Senbet after he pulled out a weapon. His vehicle riddled with bullet holes. Did uh, exit the vehicle, uh, and that's, that's when um, our officers were able to uh, uh, neutralize uh, the subject and prevent further loss of life. Surveillance video from a nearby business shows one of the victims entering and seeking help moments after the shooting. The Navy says Walter Senbet was a hospital corpsman assigned to Fort Detrick since August of 2019 with previous awards for good conduct and marksmanship. But investigators aren't sure whether he knew the two victims or why he went to the off-base Navy office. The commanding general says they were already in the process of reviewing base security procedures. In light of uh, what's happened, uh, you know, certainly across the country, uh, we were about as well prepared for it as we could. Now, the FBI, local, state, and military police are combing through the evidence at a scene that looks all too familiar. Today it happened in Frederick. Uh, a week or so ago it happened in Boulder. We always hope that we don't get that call. Today we got that call. Uh, tomorrow it could be another agency. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, 
creepy thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. Investigators are working to piece together a profile of Noah Green, focusing on what that 25-year-old suspect left inside the blue Nissan he smashed into the barricade and on the clues he left online. Sources tell CBS News law enforcement is pouring through social media accounts linked to 25-year-old Noah Green, looking for a motive and tracking his movements prior to the attack. Based on social media posts, it appears Green hit a low point in mid-March, writing he has been tried with some of the biggest unimaginable tests in his life and was unemployed. Green's social media activity also suggests he posted about Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, and at one point encouraged his followers to study revelations, study the signs of end times, study who the beast is, study who the Antichrist is. Noah Green also praised Farrakhan an outspoken anti-Semite, saying, My faith is one of the only things that has been able to carry me through these times, and my faith is centered on the belief of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as Jesus, the Messiah. The final divine reminder in our midst, he wrote, I consider him my spiritual father. Matthew 24, 3-5 Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be a worldwide event. There will be absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind as to whether this is Jesus. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, 
and God raised him from the dead. See, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.